this is the questions that we're going to be addressing today, uh, mainly because the passage is one that we'll have to ask those questions as we go through. Um, and so my question to you guys is, I really want to make sure you know what to do in these cases. What do you do when you, don't, when you are not sure how to interpret the Bible? So if you come across a passage, I hope you guys go through the Bible on your own. If you come across the Bible, you don't know how to interpret it, what do you do? And then number two is a big one. What do you do when the stuff we learn in the Bible is super far from today, society's views, culture views? I mean, I think that's pretty common. I mean, even like two years ago for myself, I was talking to a friend who I grew up with in high school, and he was, he was one who went to church, he said he was Christian, and I just talked to him, and we were talking about what we were learning, and he was, we, we came across the topic of abortion, because that's what our pastor was teaching on, and I was just like, I, I really hate abortion, because I believe that the baby is being killed in the womb. Um, and he said, well, you're just, you're just narrow-minded. You don't give the woman the choice. And uh, he was super set on that, and I was just like, no, I really think that it's, it's killing the baby. And he just, he, he, he walked off. He was like, I, I, I can't stand people like you. And he walked off. And he, realistically, he was one of my closest friends in high school. And then I never, I haven't even seen him since. Um, he's not proclaiming Christian, proclaiming Christian anymore. He's not walking with the Lord. He said I was narrow-minded and just thought and, yeah. And I realized how easy, especially for the second question, it is for people in today's society to automatically just assume that if we hold a view that we're narrow-minded, that we're bigoted, that we're um, just people who don't have, you know, a loving or tolerant view. Yeah, and sometimes when you hold fast to your views that come from the Bible, you'll, you'll be ridiculed, or you'll be, yeah, you might lose friends like I did. But that's what we're talking today. Um, I don't mean to make it all serious all, all of a sudden, but I think it's really important to go through this text because we're going to run into, I think in your lifetime, you're going to run into a lot of passages to where you're not sure how to interpret the text. You're going to run into a lot of times when you don't know how the text addresses your life specifically. You're not sure how the text, what it means, what to do, how it's relevant, how it's important. And I think that's why today, I'm asking those questions first, because to some of you, maybe it won't be as relevant, or maybe you're gonna be like, this isn't that important for me, or I don't know how to understand this verse. And the passage today is actually pretty controversial, um, and I wanted to make sure that I studied it well to present the view that came from the Bible that's biblical. And, uh, uh, it's, I mean, you see it right there. The title is God's Design for Woman. And, you kind of get an idea of where this might go. I think if I was, I might have a diversity training class in college, they would have probably already booed me off the stage because they don't like a man talking or a guy talking about girls or design for women. But, I mean, you guys know why I'm going through this because we're expositing First Timothy and we came across this text. I mean, just randomly choose this, right? So, anyways, that's my... Uh, in a sense, justification, but let's just open our Bibles. If you have your Bible, open to 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. And I'll have it on the screen if you don't have your Bible, and, um, or you can share it with your friends. First Timothy 2, verse 8. We're going to read to the end of the chapter. just read through the screen. So let me pray before we get into this, um, just because we want to hear God's word and not my own. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for this time that we can be here. I thank you for this time that we can hear from your word. God, I pray that you keep us focused. I pray that you keep us interested and you'd help us to understand what to do in times when the Bible may not seem relevant to us or times when we don't know how to understand the context of the passage or times when the world's view is just really different from what we see in your word. 
Help us to hold fast to the scriptures. Help us to learn today. Help us to be interested, God, because I, I personally think it's really interesting. Lord, I pray that everyone here can have that same heart and same mindset, God. Um, be with us in your name, I pray. Amen. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm going to read through it. I'll just read off this thing so I can keep with you guys. Uh, verse 8, it says, I desire, therefore, that in any place, every place the men should be pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. And let's just stop here for now, because this is the only verse that is going to address the men. And this verse actually relates a lot more to last week than it does to this week. Uh, last week, we talked about a quiet and godly life in prayer. And he says, the men should pray without anger or quarreling. The men uh, should have holy hands, basically hands of worship. You lift your hands when you praise. And that's the exhortation he gives to the men. Don't be angry, pray, and worship with holy hands. And I have to ask you guys, um, did you guys try to pray at all last week, any more than normal? Or did you have the attitude of prayer at all? Just think of that. That's your application today, men. That's literally the verse that's on it. And so we're going to move on to verse 9. And, yeah, let's just look through these words. And behold, the, the word of God, it says, Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable, apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And uh, verse 13, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness and self-control. And uh, I realize as I read through these, text, it can be a little tense, and I realize that when I go through these passages, you guys are just all quiet, like it's just silent. I feel like I should go through these passages more because I don't get that feeling as much. But now you guys see what we're going to deal with today. Now you guys see why I asked those questions. Today's going to be really challenging, um, but I ask, I think it's going to be really interesting, so I ask that you guys will uh, do your best to pay attention and to focus um, as we unpack the text. So, what do you do? Let's go back to those questions. What do you do when you're not sure how to interpret the Bible passage? Maybe some of you went across these verses and you're like, oh, I know exactly what this means for me and is relevant in the context today, but I doubt that that's many of you. Maybe. Yeah, I really doubt that you guys have that view. What do you do when you're not sure how to interpret this? What does this mean to me? What do you do? Does anyone know? You can shout it out if you know. Read the bottom part of your study Bible. <laughs> That's actually pretty good. That's very good. You, I drew this out for you guys. You look at the context. I tried really hard. It's hard with a mouse. That's what you do. You look at the context. And how do you look at, how do you find the context? Um, you need to ask, what did it mean at the time when it was written? Questions like, who's the author? Um, the basically the, the environment when it was written, what did it mean during that context, that time period? And so let's ask, who's the author? It's Paul, right? Who's he writing to? He's writing to Timothy, the church of Ephesus. Um, he wrote it somewhere in 52 to 56 uh, AD. But what did Paul mean when he wrote these texts at the time? How did the readers understand it at that time? And before we jump into everything, um, I just want to point out straight from verse 12, because this is actually the verse that um, is one of the most controversial. But there's something I want to point out um, right here. Verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. What did the original readers, what did Paul mean when he wrote that verse? And what did the original readers take it to mean? And I pulled out the Greek right here just to better explain this because your translations and the ESV translations might not 
um, give you a full understanding of it. And so when it says, I do not permit a woman to teach, Paul is actually using this one, uh, idaskin, or didaskin, sorry, which is a present infinitive. If you guys do grammar, you know, know what it is. I don't even know exactly how these things work. But it's a present infinitive. And so the best translation would be to be a teacher. So when he was writing it at that time, he's saying, I do not permit a woman to be a teacher. He's not saying, per se, just to teach. Um, and we know that because we see when they, he uses those to believe, pisteo sal, um, and to be a believer, pisteain, pisteain, I don't know. <laughs> we know that it's the same, same thing. It's the same verb endings, it's the same. And so to believe, to be a believer, to teach, to be a teacher. So your Bible might say to teach, or your Bible might say to be a teacher, and that's actually pretty important to understand the difference. Um, because here, oh, really? Is it? No. Is there anything else? Oh my goodness. I have like 12 more slides, dang it. I guess it just didn't save. But it's okay. This is uh, <laughs> it's all right. I have I have everything here, but you guys might not be able to see it. Um, so in the context back then, remember Paul is saying to Timothy and the Ephesian church this. He's saying, "I do not permit a woman to be a teacher over men." In the context of the church, I do not permit a woman to be a teacher over men. That's what he was saying to the Ephesian, to Timothy and the Ephesians, and that's what they understood it as. And uh, part of the reason was because some women were claiming to be pastors or prophetesses, and um, they were trying to take, take over or lead parts of the church. And he's saying the same thing. I do not, in the church, I do not permit women's, women to be teachers. Rather, they are to keep silent. And so my question is, I wish I had this on the slide, but just pay attention to this one. My question to you guys is, when you see scripture like this, that's how they understood it back then. That was the context back then. Are you always supposed to follow in its exact same context? So this is a yes or no question. Are we always supposed to follow the Bible in its exact same context? You guys understand, right? How, how Paul understood it, how the Ephesians understood it, how Timothy understood it. Are we supposed to, in our context, understand and follow it in the exact same context always? So it's rhetorical. Some of you guys are probably thinking yes. Some of you guys are probably thinking no. Um, take some time. Come up with like a yes or no in your head. And so if your answer is yes, if your answer is yes, then I really want you guys to look with me at verse 9. Can I, can you pull it up again? So I can just pull up the verses. I don't, I don't need that other stuff. If your answer is yes, then I want you guys to look at verse 9. If you say yes, we should follow the context exactly as it was when they understood. When, and then I want to point out, it says... In respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold and pearls or costly attire. You see what I'm pointing out? If you're always supposed to follow in the same exact context, then how come we have no problems in the church with braided hair or with gold rings? But yet, a lot of times, women preachers is the thing. You guys understand that, right? What, why, why is 11 and 12 sometimes people are like, oh yeah, women can't teach over men, but yeah, when they come to verse 9, braided hair, gold, and pearls, there's no big deal. I mean, it's like mo most of the mothers in this or the wives in this room, you have a golden ring, right? Something like that. Uh, a lot of you have had braided hair. So how come this one is no, no, not a big deal, but the second one is? You guys see the problem here, right? Yeah? 
And so I want you guys to think about that. How do we know which texts we're supposed to strictly follow what it says and which texts we're, we're not supposed to follow strictly, as strictly? How do we know? Uh, you guys can shout out the answer. If you know the answer, I'll give you a boba. Does anyone know? It's pretty close, but how, okay. How do we know? How do we know which texts we have to strictly follow and which texts we may not have to strictly follow? Because you saw verse nine, people don't strictly follow that one, and then verse, just shout it out. Go ahead. Context. <laughs> he said it first. I, I said it before. He said it first. Okay, all right, Daniel. Oh, I, 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 was, I had a, a, a whole slide that this was the whole page. That's what it said. Yeah, right there. So it was, it was supposed to take, I put a lot of work into that too. I'm so sad. You look at the context. That's how you know. Look at the context. And how do we do that? How do we do that? You ask what it meant at that time, right? Um, but if you're taking notes, uh, make sure to write this down or just focus on this point. You look at the context. That's how you know which ones you strictly follow and which ones maybe not as much. Because the answer is you have to find the heart behind the text or behind the words. You have to find the heart behind the words. And that's the answer. That answers your first question. You look at the context and you find the heart behind it. Because with braided hair, that's perfectly okay for everyone, right? No one comes and says, no braided hair. But with the women teaching, you see a lot of churches, they say, yeah, women should not be teaching over men. But we need to find the heart behind it. See, back then, when it talked about, um, when it talked about women uh, and the braiding of hair and the gold and costly pearls, Paul's addressing women who would spend hours um, just making sure that their hair looked beautiful and they would spend thousands of dollars or tons of money on putting on expensive jewelry. And it was just so they could have vain beauty, this outside beauty of, I want to look just absolutely beautiful, so I'm going to spend all my, a lot of time and money to just present myself as physically beautiful. And he's saying, don't do that. See, his reasoning for doing those things isn't because braiding the hair is wrong. It's not because having like a gold ring that's wrong. It's because God calls for them to be modest, respectable, and have self-control, to profess godliness, as it says in verse 10. And that's why today, today, like we have no problem with braiding of hair as long as you know you're not just only caring about outside beauty. We have no problem with gold rings in that sense. Because the heart behind it was to address the fact of women who would only care about their outside beauty and spend hours and tons of time on it. Yet, do you see what I'm getting at in terms of the heart? What about when it comes to the teaching? Let a woman learn quietly with false submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, rather she is to remain quiet. What is the heart behind that? What is Paul's reasoning for writing that? What does he appeal to? Do you guys know? Uh, I didn't hear what you said, but <laughs> if you look in verse 9 and you look around it, he appeals to modesty, self-control, respectable apparel, and godliness as the reasons for not having braided hair. But what is his reasoning for appealing to verse 12? And quietness, verse 11, and verse 12. Do the same thing you did in uh, verse 9 in terms of looking around. Um, I guess it's hard if you have a screen. If you're using your Bible, it's going to help you a lot more. What he does is he appeals, I'll just give you the answer. He appeals to the design of woman. Do you understand that? So for the first one, he's appealing to, you should not have braided hair, you should not have 
honesty, so I mean, uh, you should. You shouldn't have gold and pearls because of modesty, self-control for respectableness and for godliness. That's the reason. But when he talks about teaching, he appeals to the design for women. He goes back to creation. He, he, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. God made Adam first. And if you guys know creation, God made Adam first, and then he made Eve out of Adam's rib, and he gave the responsibility to Adam to take care of Eve. Um, yeah, he goes all the way back to how God made them. That's what he does. And so, verse 14, it says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgression. I mean, you guys remember, the serpent, she didn't go to Adam, she, or he didn't go to Adam, he went to Eve. And what happened was Eve stepped out of the protection of Adam's responsibility and leadership, and she was deceived. Yet, Adam wasn't deceived. This says, that's what it says right here in the text. Adam was not deceived. Um, man, I had a quote that I didn't even write down here. because I was so confident. I was just going to read it off there. But it, a scholar says that when she, I'll, I'll just summarize it, when she stepped out of the protection and leadership of Adam, she gave herself to fall to temptation by the serpent. And Adam, in not taking that responsibility over Eve, he allowed her, and they both ate, and they both sinned. And so who's, whose fault is it? Is it Adam's or Eve's? It's pretty easy, it's both of theirs. I mean. But, because they both ate the fruit, but Adam had a bigger responsibility. It was more of Adam's fault because it was more of his responsibility. Eve stepped out of his leadership, and Adam, um, yeah, just didn't take that leadership upon him. It was Adam's responsibility, and that's why it's primarily his fault. And so what you see in creation is that God designed women and men in a way that's different. He designed them in a way to where a man is responsible to live as a man before God, and a woman is responsible to live as a woman before God. And, you know, some might say, that's, that's just unfair. They're like, that's absolutely unfair. Why do the men get to lead and the women uh, don't? Why do the men get to teach in the church and the women don't? Why does it say that the women are to submit? And we're in quietness. Doesn't that entail that the man is greater than the woman? If he is, if he is the one who, if he's the only one who gets to lead in the church, or he's the only one who gets to be a teacher in the church. And I want you guys to understand it does not at all. Not one bit. I think the best way to show God's design for women, or God's design for women and men, is an illustration. Uh, my pastor, uh, actually at this church, I shouldn't wear this shirt anymore, but um, he, uh, he told me an illustration. And how many of you watched the Olympics or the Winter Olympics last time? Like a little, uh, anything at all? I, I watched some, but one of the coolest things that I love to watch in the Olympics is uh, couples ice skating. And you're probably like, wow, what a, what a, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> no, like, I, I, I loved, I, I was watching it with my parents, and they were, like, excited, and I was, like, secretly excited, but not, you know, showing it, but I was actually excited. But I think it's just incredible, because when you watch couples ice skating, you see them, like, super fast speed spinning, he throws her up, he catches her, and I'm just like, man, if I threw, you know, a girl up, I would just totally allow her to fall on her face. <laughs> I, I, I'm amazed, but the reason I bring this up is because this illustration, I think, really shows um, that it's, it's, it's different roles, yet one is not lesser than the other. You see, the man, the man is responsible, he's, he's, he's the one who's supposed to throw her up, he catches her, he has to throw her up at the exact angle and speed, and they all have to do the right thing, and 
or else she's going to fall. And so in that, the woman is submitting to his strength. Yet when you watch ice skating, do you think, oh, the man is the guy we watch? He's greater? No. And do you go to, you know, you're like, oh, the woman's greater? I mean, maybe. But just like, no, no, that's not the case. You don't see a lesser. They're equal. They have different roles. You marvel. At least I marvel. I'm like, wow. They've given their life to something that's amazing. It's beautiful. No one is lesser than the other. In fact, the woman is often more presented. Like, she's up here, you know, the guy's, like, behind her. And that's a lot of times what you see in the role of a man and a woman. And that's how it should be the same way as God's design. In fact, God, in the Bible, or in the Bible, you'll see all the time, you know, present the church, present the bride of Christ. The the church is the bride of Christ, if you didn't know that. Present her, spotless. And I just have this idea of when the man, you know, he's, like, skating around and he's just like showing the woman you know that's kind of like the presenting it's it's beautiful and so if you think again if you think that submission makes you less than than a person or not having the leadership then what you're saying is that when jesus because jesus the son is submits to the father at all times you're saying jesus is lesser than god and that's one of the greatest blasphemies you can commit. If you're saying that just because one submits and the other doesn't, that's, that's absolute blasphemy to say that Jesus is lesser than God if you're saying submission makes you lesser than another. So I want you guys to understand that. Just because one is called to a different role, Jesus has a different role, the Spirit has different roles, if they're equal in deity. Just because one has a different role does not make them lesser. They are equal. God, Son, Spirit are equal. Man and woman are equal, yet the design and the roles are different. I mean, even last week, we talked about, you know, pursuing a quiet life in prayer, a life of constantly not caring about being great, but just wanting to pray before God, be known by God. And that's, that's noble. That's absolutely noble. You don't have to be this great person who's known. You just have to be known by God. And so my encouragement, especially to the woman, but again, no, men and women, follow God's design for your life. And the woman, it says in verse 9, that they should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty, self-control, not with braided hair. And um, in the Greek, you'll see that um, when it talks about modesty, it's actually talking about, I wish I had my slides, but it actually talks about it's your responsibility to dress and act in a way to where you might not hurt or stumble anyone, especially your brothers, as if it's completely irresponsible. And what they would have understood it back then would even use the word shamefacedly to have shame if you were to ever hurt or stumble someone. And I want you guys to know that responsibility. That's what young women should be called to. Adorn themselves with respectable apparel, modesty, self-control. And in verse 10, but with, with, with what is proper for women who profess godliness. That's, that's the calling for Woman, that's God's design for women, specifically here in this context of the church. And it's not just dressing. It's really how you act. Like, if you dress modestly, but, you know, your whole whole time you're just trying to get attention of guys, or you lead them on, or you flirt, that's not really godliness. That's more of the world. And I really just want to encourage you don't let the world tell you how you ought to act or dress. Don't worry if you're not like the coolest person at school because that, that's the world's standards. Your goal is to be pleasing to God. Like, like listen, um, I think especially in this culture, it's so easy to just allow everyone to tell you who you ought to be. That you ought to be 
you know, you ought to dress this way, you ought to talk this way, you ought to act this way. But if you're a Christian, young woman, that means you're a daughter of God. And God is the most high God. And I want you to think, a father who protects his daughter, like a good father will protect his daughter no matter what, right? But God is perfect. He loves his daughters so much. Like you are loved beyond measure. When God sees you, he sees someone who's absolutely beautiful. And that's why when you're at school, you don't need to feel beautiful in front of other people per se. I mean, because God already sees you as beautiful. You don't need to do things that make you feel like you have to earn something because God already sees you as his beautiful daughter. You don't have to get the attention of the girls or guys around you. I know girls a lot of times can put more standards on girls than the guys will. You don't have to do any of those things. What you have to do is you have to be pleasing before God. Your design, your calling is to live an honoring life of beauty before God. And what is beautiful to God? Living in a way that's Godliness, verse 10, modest, respectable, self-control. That's absolutely beautiful before God. And I don't know. I think sometimes it's going to be really hard because the world's going to tell you everything else. But God's word is going to tell you that you are perfect before him if you are a Christian. Let's move on to verse 15. It says, Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self control. Um, and this is saying that you need to be a mom to be saved. Did you hear what I just said? That's blasphemy. Don't listen to that. <laughs> that's, that's what some people might say, but that's, you guys know that's not true. So if anyone says anything like that, then just don't even listen to them. Um, what this means is that childbearing, uh, it's a confusing verse, right? You look at it. Yes, she will be saved through childbearing, right? It's, what does that mean? Childbearing has some aspect to which it connects to our salvation. That's what it means. That if you raise children in holiness, that connects to our salvation. Um, I want you to think about it. So Eve, she had children, right? And if you know Seth, she raised them up in the Lord, at least Seth, her child. And we see the genealogy of they continue to raise people up in the Lord. Not everyone, but some of them. And if you look through Matthew or Luke and you see the genealogy, it goes all the way from Eve to Jesus. That the raising up of the, the people who were raised up in the Lord contributed to Jesus' lineage, Jesus' line. And you guys know that Jesus is the one who saves us. That it was Jesus' blood that saves us. That his cross. And so just the idea of he was born of a woman. Mary was from the line of all the way up to Eve. And so through that, we were able to receive salvation through, through that childbearing. And do you want to know why you guys ought to live according to God's design for your life as a man, as a woman, as a Christian? It's because of that. It's because of the gospel. That's the reason. If I tell you just to live like in a certain way, that means nothing. It comes back to our salvation through Christ, who was born from that lineage. That Christ himself was willing to die. And if you know about the gospel, you'll know that Christ was forsaken. I think people leave this out all the time. Christ was forsaken. That he literally cried out to God, why have you forsaken me? That it wasn't just nails. It wasn't just uh, the Roman suffering. It wasn't just a betrayal of his friends and disciples. It was actually that Christ was, his father turned away from him. 
that God said, no, you are despicable. You are evil. You are the rapist. You are the murderer. He said that to Christ. That he poured out his wrath. He, Christ was forsaken. The son was forsaken. And that is the mystery of the gospel. That came out through childbearing, through the lineage. That's the reason that we live according to God's design, and no other reason. If you want some motivation, there's nothing stronger than that. That's why we need to study the gospel and know it more and more, because that's the motivation to why we live out the faith, is because on that cross, Christ was forsaken. He bore your sins. He was punished. And it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. So many times we just forget about that. We forget about what our life's about. Like if you look at creation, that's the whole, the center point of creation. The reason that it was made was all the center around the gospel. Christ's death, his perfect life, his death, his suffering, his resurrection. And that is our hope and in no other place. That Christ was willing to die. And so verse 15 just shows that it was through childbearing that we had salvation. And if they continue in faith, so it's, it's, still, it's still present tense. It's not, it didn't end there. Yet she will be saved, future tense, I mean. She will be saved through childbearing. See, one of the callings that God has in his design for women is to raise children in godliness, just as Eve and the lineage, some of the lineage did. Um, and specifically for women because they spend a lot of time in the beginning when you're nursing the kid. Um, but God has designed them to raise their kids in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. And that's something that is actually really hard to do. It's a role, it's not just women, like the father is in many ways equally important, but you see how because of the nursing, the woman is with them, the mother is with them more, a lot more often. But the idea of child raising is actually something that we in this culture don't really care too much about. We let schools raise children. Like, think about it. Um, look at the kids around you in your school, even in church. Like, would you say that they exhibit a great measure of faith, love, holiness, and self-control? Like, honestly, maybe not. You know? And so a lot of the design that God had was childbearing is an amazing thing to raise a child up in holiness and self-control. I mean, Paul is saying that through the mom raising her child, she in some way is aligning with a means of salvation and raising them away from sin. And so it connects. Think about it. Eve led them to sin. She took the leadership and led to sin. But motherhood leads away from sin. I wish I had the slide again. But think about it, right? Eve led to sin. The motherhood leads away from sin. That if you correctly are able to parent your child and raise them up in holiness, you're leading them away from sin. And I was uh, talking to one of you guys. I'm not going to say who, but you said, you told me, you're like, when I grow up, I want to be a stay-at-home mom with 10 kids. I was just like, wow, Okay. And uh, I want you to know that that is absolutely noble. Like, the world might not say that's a good thing, but that's act- and actually that's an amazing thing. If that's your desire, I'm not saying that you have to do that. Like you should do that. I'm just saying like that. If you do that, that's that's absolutely noble. Because raising in the Bible, raising your children is a command and a calling. Raising them in the Lord, whereas job job's not a command. Work security none of that's a command. And even raising your kids in the Lord is more important than your ministry work for those around you. Do you understand that? That their first call, that's why the, the, the rule of elders is they have to manage their household well. They have to raise their kids well. That's a, that's a requirement. Because it's first most, you raise your kids first and then your ministry comes after that if you are a parent, you're 
the raising of your children is a bigger priority than even the ministry for those around you. And uh, so the big idea is, dang it, there's no big idea here. The big idea is that we, all of us, have got to live faithfully in light of God's design for our lives. All of us have got to live faithfully in light of God's design for our lives. And I'm going to close this pretty soon. But I just want to, you know, remind you guys and make sure that um, it's for everyone, men, women, everyone, that when you read your Bible for yourself, make sure you understand the context. Make sure you know the context. Read around it. Find a good commentary. Whoever shouted out the MacArthur, that's, that's solid. Or ESP scholar one, that's the one I use, that red and white one. Um, and I'll tell you what happened. But when you study the text, I want you guys to pay attention to this. When you guys study the text, like look up if you're not looking at it. It's so much more important not just to know the context, but to have the heart behind it. When you, so when you see something in text, like if you do it, that's... That's good. It's good to listen to the Bible, right? But when you talk, when we talk about dressing modestly, when we talk about living respectable, when we talk about praying, which we did last week, when we talk about obeying your parents, it's one thing if you do it, but it's another thing if you make sure that your heart is doing it because you love God, because you want to please God, because you want to glorify God. God, I am acting in this way because I want to live for you. God, I am dressing in this way because I want to please you. God, I'm reading your word because I want you to be glorified. I want to know you more. It's more than just a checkbox. Because at the end of the day, God's looking at your heart. He's not just pleased if you uh, follow the right instructions and listen to your parents. And so when you go through the text and it says what to do, and you understand the context, and you know what it means. Make sure that the reasons you do those things are because you want to live for God, or because you want to please Him. It's because you truly want to honor God, and that's why, you know, when we live faithfully in light of God's design for our life, it glorifies God. Because we do it, because, not because, oh, everyone's going to think I'm good. Or I just want to please my parents. We do it because we want to be faithful before God. And um, yeah, just keep that with you guys. Let me close this prayer. Dear God, I thank you for this time. I know that I wasn't able to show a lot of things that I wanted to, Lord, but I pray that you will still be convicting them through the Spirit, that you will still be moving, that you will still... Um, just show from your word through the text. You will show the design for men to live as they ought to, glorifying before you, and you will show the same for women. I pray for the young men and the young women in this room that you will know how to live. And that we will do it because we love you, God. I pray for specifically for the women, especially those who struggle with wanting to be you know, acceptable in the standards of the world. God, help them understand that they are loved by you, that they are absolutely beautiful before you, God. Help them not to look at pleasing the world and those around them. But show them their worth in Christ. God, I pray you help us. Help us to live according to who you are in your Bible. You help us to understand those two questions, what to do when we don't know uh, how to interpret the text, and what to do when, when culture is just so different, God. We have to trust in you. We have to look to the gospel. We have to know we're loved and beautiful before you, God. Help us. Give us a good time of discussion, and um, yeah, help us to have a good weekend that's glorifying before you, Lord. Help us with any struggles we have. I pray for no one as he's sick. And he's going in missions next week, Lord. I pray for just all of us here and those who work here that we will be able to live faithfully before you. In your name I pray. Amen.